Hi, everybody. I think it's about time to get started. So uh, before we start, I want to, want to get a show of hands. How many of you have used Ceph before? All right, a pretty good number. So, um, so I want to go over a bit of background about Ceph first, um, for those of you who haven't used it before. So Ceph was originally created by um, Sage Weil. And Sage is just a brilliant guy. He's been doing interesting things all his life. When he was in high school, he created uh, Web WebRing. You may have heard of this, which was bought by GeoCities. Then when he went to college, he founded DreamHost. At his time, while he was at DreamHost, he, uh, he encountered uh, these large like, um, SANs that you use to store all these files, and had lots of uh, interesting problems managing them. And he was very interested in storage, so he decided to pursue a PhD. And the result of that PhD was Ceph. So Ceph is a distributed storage system, which, which was designed to uh, scale as wide as possible to petabytes and exabytes and beyond. And Sage's whole philosophy in designing stuff is to make it very easy to manage. So instead of having uh, one large box that uh, might have th many things fail inside of it that you can't access, he wanted to have a system that you could uh, fully um, look inside of. And I, mean, I meant making it all uh, software-based. So stuff is uh, fully software-based. Um, it runs on commodity hardware, and it's very. Um, it tries to ma make everything much easier for you by automatically uh, having multiple copies of data, making everything um, consistent, and trying to make the life of an admin and a user much easier. So it, it really helps uh, bring down your costs and time and money. Uh, Ceph has also uh, tried to be very flexible. So it didn't. It, it, although it originally was started as a, a system to uh, create a file system, a POSIX compliant file system. Um, it, was architected, it was architected in a way so that it could be a, a base layer for developing many other kinds of things. So today, um, we have block storage and object storage uh, built directly on top of Ceph. And the Ceph file system is, in fact, uh, kind of a lesser part so, so far, less developed. Um, so Ceph, Ceph is all open source. It's all licensed under, under the LGPL. There's nothing secret about it at all. Everything's up on GitHub. And uh, you can go download it today. So I wanted to go over a bit of uh, Ceph architecture how Ceph, and how Ceph works internally, and then uh, go over some the recent changes in Ceph in the last six months, uh, what's, happen, what's going to happen in the next release, and maybe what's going, possible features in the future. So. Like I said before, uh, Ceph is trying to be a very um, generalized layer at the lowest level. And this lowest level is, is a strongly consistent, reliable object store called Vados. Um, this basically means that um, you're, you're storing objects in, in this object store, but it also supplies um, more than just simple reads and writes. Um, it has uh, transactions that you can uh, add arbitrary operations to. So it's a very rich. Uh, environment in which to develop other applications. So you can see there's several different layers above uh, the basic Rados level. You can have um, the Rados gateway, which is an HTTP uh, REST API that provides a Swift and S3 interface to the underlying Rados storage. There is a, a Ceph block device, or RBD, which is a virtual block device striped over objects in a cluster. And finally, there is the Ceph file system, which is a POSIX compliant file system, and uh, which has been upstream in the Linux kernel since uh, 2632 or 34, and uh, has a, also has a Fuse client if you don't want to install a new kernel module. So how does Ceph work internally? Well, um, at a low level, all Ceph needs is a disk and a file system. So in Ceph, there are uh, three kinds of storage servers. There are the, the most basic is the OSD, or object storage daemon. Just this sits on top of any kind of uh, regular Linux file system. It could be ButterFS, XFS, or ext 4 or even ZFS more recently. Um, it, all it needs is extended attribute support. And these OSDs form the basis of the cluster. They store all the data in themselves. So from a a uh, uh, user's point of view, they're accessing the cluster through some mechanism here. And this whole giant set of servers uh, represents just a, 
uh, basic um, object store where they can do all, uh, put, it, put objects and get, get them back without having to worry about um, which, when disks fail or when servers fail. Um, the OSDs will automatically re-replicate anything that go, that's missing or anything that needs to be have more copies made of it. The three M's you see there are called the monitor servers. And uh, the, the monitors um, basically provide uh, a, a record of cluster state. So they run the Paxos algorithm, which makes that, um, make sure that they're consistent with each other and they can't have a split brain scenario. Um, they keep track of, like, for example, which uh, OSDs are up or which OSDs are down. And they're not in a data path. They just provide this map of uh, which OSDs are up and down right now, or which monitors are up and down right now, to the clients and to the OSDs so that they can tell where, where the data where needs, needs to go. So generally, um, the OSDs run on top of one disk. You could potentially run them on top of a RAID if you have a very large storage array or a very large server that has, say, 70 disks. Maybe you don't have enough memory or enough uh, processor power to support 72 OSDs. So you might want to read them together in that case. But usually, people we recommend uh, running out one per disk. Um, basically, an, an OSD is responsible for managing uh, all the storage, all the objects. There is no, nothing, nothing stored, is stored on the monitors. Everything is stored on the OSDs. And they all talk to each other in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion so that they notice when, when uh, other OSDs have failed, and we report that up to the monitors. And then the monitors can update that cluster map, which then gets propagated via a gossip protocol to the rest of the cluster. So the cluster knows what's happening all the time. So that's a, basically the state of the cluster. But how do you actually access the cluster? How do you find out where your data is? Well, there's several different approaches that you can take to finding where, um, where data is stored among a, a group of servers. Uh, the most basic is you, you uh, Write, it, write, it, write, it, uh, write your data somewhere to some group, set of servers, and then store in some other service uh, where that uh, set of servers was, and a mapping from, uh, say, an object name to a set of servers. And that's OK, but it doesn't really scale. It adds another layer in the data path where you have to keep looking up um, where, your, where your data is, which isn't really necessary. So a common solution to this is using something ha like hashing or sharding. Which, is, uh, which uh, lets the client uh, say, just hash the object and figure out exactly which server it goes to and it needs to find the data on. But if you just do simple ha hashing, um, when you take out, uh, when a server goes down or when you add more capacity, uh, a whole bunch of data needs to be reshuffled. So Ceph uses a, 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 bit, a slightly smarter algorithm called Crush, which, um, so, Basically, how Ceph locates data is by taking the hash of the object name and then uh, splitting that into a number of uh, placement groups, or PGs, which are basically just shards of data to make managing uh, cluster state easier. And it, puts, and it takes that um, placement group, the existing cluster state, which is maintained by the monitors, like which OSDs are up, which ones are down, and a set of rules describing uh, what, what, how your cluster is uh, in, uh, physically, like if there are different racks or different rows or um, different hosts that devices live on. And at the output of the crush algorithm is then which servers store that data. So basically, you have a bunch of objects that, um, and, you ha and you, these are chunked up into pla different placement groups for management by the uh, OSDs. And each OSD uh, is uh, responsible for a random subset of these placement groups based on crush. So if a single OSD goes down, for example, um, you see the yellow box and the, and the green block here that were previously located on it move, uh, are re-replicated to other OSDs automatically. But since crush is a stable algorithm, the same, uh, if the same OSD comes back up again, the data will, come, will be stored again in the same place again. Um, when it comes back up. So another um, nice thing about the crush is because it can, you can model your, your database, your uh, topology of your, of your storage, you can uh, have custom rules that define exactly like what kind of, um, 
placement you want, policy you want for your, for your data. So you could have, say, a, a set of fast servers and a set of slow servers, and have the first replica be on a set of fast servers, since reads are always served from the first replica, and the rest of the replicas be from a set of slow servers that you don't care so much about, uh, say, write performance with. You could also do some things like separating replicas across rows or across racks, or just simply across hosts to make sure that you can separate your failure domains. Um, Crush also handles just uh, separate weights for each device, so you can have separately sized disks uh, with, no, with no issues there. So that's basically how a client can talk to the cluster, and there's several different ways that it can do this. So the lowest level API is called uh, Libratos, which is a user space library which has bindings in C, C++, and Java, and basically, Libratos talks to the monitors and it, talks, it gets the cluster state, and then it can talk directly to all of the OSDs in parallel if it, if it wants. So this is kind of the, the lowest layer which everything else is built on top of. So there's no extra overhead here. It's, it's, it's the lowest direct access to the cluster you can have. So you can have a client that accesses all the OSDs and gets the benefits of all that performance of all those disks at once if you, ha if you have enough parallelism. So a higher level above that is the Rados Gateway, which I mentioned earlier, uh, provides the S3 and Swift API on, on top of um, the object store. And this basically uses uh, uh, Libratos to talk to the object store, and also some custom object classes, um, which allow custom operations in a tr transaction on a single object. For example, to allow it atomically uh, updating an, an attribute on an object while uh, adding data to it. So the Rados gateways are just stateless um, servers that coordinate among themselves um, if they, when they're caching uh, authentication information. And they also provide um, multi-tenancy. Since the uh, native Rados uh, doesn't have multi-tenancy directly, the Rados gateway provides that um, through the idea of in, this, in, in the HTTP APIs of the access keys and tokens and the users, and also tracks all the usage information for all of that. So the Rados gateway is basically just a, a, proxy, a proxy that translates uh, the Swift and S3 into Rados. So the, another la layer up is uh, RBD, or the Ceph block device. This is the layer that's um, most uh, often used in, in uh, OpenStack as a uh, volume in Cinder. So a block device in, um, is basically striped over a bunch of objects in, in the cluster. And it has the same benefits of um, Libreta, so it can access all these servers in parallel and do all, all kinds of reads and writes in parallel without, without any kind of serialization and any kind of central authority. Because it can, because of crush, it knows exactly where the data needs to go and is calculated on the fly. Since this is all a shared storage, uh, this means that uh, if you actually have a, a virtual machine that is booted off of an Rados block device, uh, it doesn't have to depend on the local local server. So you can have diskless compute hosts, or you could even migrate uh, a virtual machine from one, one node to, to another while it's uh, running off of RVD. There's also a kernel module, which has been upstream since 2637, which lets you uh, um, directly map a uh, Rados block device to a regular Linux block device. So you can just ha have like dev RVD zero show up and uh, mount it and, and uh, run, have a file system on top of that directly if you want. If you're not doing virtualization. Now, the Rados block device also has a few other nice features. It supports uh, thin provisioning, so everything is thin provisioned by default. Um, when you create one, it doesn't use any extra space, really. It just stores what, what the name of it is, what the size of it is. Um, it also ha supports uh, efficient snapshots and cloning, so you can take a snapshot at any time. It'll, it'll be consistent with all everything that's, that's there at that time. If you um, even while running a virtual machine, if you make sure that your application is, is a safe state, you can take a snapshot while it's still running. So, this, uh, um, if you have multiple uh, virtual machines running, basically they're all accessing the cluster and uh, through the same, um, 
and different paths. So they're all going to different OSDs because the data is placed randomly across the cluster. There's no single bottleneck, and you can scale out through uh, uh, arbitrary size. But how do you spin up so many virtual machines when you have a sudden, a sudden need or a sudden spike in demand and you want to so, um, create new, uh, a bunch of, say, 100 new web servers? How do you do that? Well, if you have the web servers backed by the various block device, you can just create a, a simple clone. So if, you have, if you've taken a snapshot of uh, an existing web server that's ready to run, um, you can just uh, use a simple clone which uses no extra space and it's an instantaneous uh, copy of, the, of that block device. So then when you go, it's a copy and write clone, so when a virtual machine starts using the new clone and they start writing to it, they'll copy the data from the parent um, and then uh, uh, from the parent object to the, chi uh, ch the child of the, cl the clone object that you just created. But for reads, they're still going to fall back to the parent if the object in the child doesn't exist. So one of the things that's, um, that used to be, it can be very slow in, um, in Nova is actually uh, creating uh, new virtual machines by copying all the data out of Glance um, onto a local disk and then creating a new copy of that file to boot a virtual machine off of. So in the, in the Folsom release, we had uh, change, changed this a bit to allow um, Glance to be backed by RBD and also Cinder to be backed by RBD. So you can have your virtual machine templates in, a, uh, this, this, uh, in Ceph, as well as your volumes in Ceph. And if you created that, you could, uh, there's an API call added to create a, a volume from an image. And yet these are both, back, if Glance and Cinder were both backed by Ceph, this, this uh, new volume would just be a, a clone. So it would be an instantaneous copy with no extra space used. Whereas in, in the previous um, model, you have to copy all the data over to uh, get anything out of the template, basically. So that's basically an overview of uh, how the block device works. But uh, what's happened in the last six months? So in January, we had our second stable release, which was the Bobtail release. Um, a number of things improved there. At the, in the, in the OSD level, um, how it interacts with the file system and with it, it's, a, its journal, which can be on a separate device for faster writes. Um, was, uh, performance was, was improved quite a bit by uh, rearranging how the locks worked, and making them more fine-grained and less coarse. So the single, uh, the, the, the IOPS that a single OSD could get out of a single uh, underlying file, uh, file system increased from 6,000 to 22,000. And also, we structured how the OSD uh, interprets updates to the uh, state of the cluster. So the placement group concept that I was mentioning earlier is um, the unit of recovery and stuff. So whenever the state changes, um, a placement group may need to be re-replicated to a different OSD. But uh, many, uh, many updates to the map only affect, say, a, a certain subset of placement groups. So in Bobtail, we made the uh, map handling happen on a per placement group basis. So it's no longer the entire OSD going through the list of all the placement groups at once, but each one can go through and update itself uh, to the new map according, um, independently. That, that just improves general quality of service when you uh, have lots of ev events happening in your cluster, like noise dying or new nodes being added. Um, in addition uh, to help, so in addition to the uh, uh, map handling, adding a priority system to the way that messages are, are, are processed in the OSD, uh, increased the ability of clients to cont continue um, I.O. while recovery is happening, while more data is being rep replicated throughout the cluster. So basically, um, the old system al uh, could allow uh, clients to be starved by high priority uh, recovery operations, but now uh, because we have uh, the priority system has been re reworked to be based on weights, and um, recovery operations can be placed lower than uh, than client uh, 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 operations without making them uh, totally starve. So, 
clients can continue sending requests and continue being served without any interruption in service while recovery is still happening in the background. And also, uh, because it's uh, now uh, weight-based, it can also be changed dynamically. So if you have like a certain subset of objects that you want to uh, recover more efficiently or more, more, more quickly, for example, uh, now if, we, if you try to access a certain object that hasn't been recovered yet, it'll be queued for recovery next. So the, the block device cloning that I was talking about is also a, a new feature in Bobtail. Um, it, the, uh, it was in, I was integrated in Cinder with Balsam, and the uh, ability to copy an image from Glance that's uh, non-raw, that is, a, it's like QCOW2 or some other format, uh, is now, they, they can now be converted into a uh, raw format image, which is suitable for actual use by a virtual machine off of RBD. Um, in Grizzly. And on the Radius Gateway side, um, the Radius Gateway learned how to talk to a keystone to authenticate Swift API requests. So it can automatically create users based on the, the tokens it sees from Keystone. And um, it makes it easier to manage your users that, that way and just generally uh, use with OpenStack. And if you look at the Ceph Juju charm, you can just uh, install. Keystone, uh, Keystone uh, Ceph, and have it all working together well with very little effort. So what's coming up in the next stable release, Cuttlefish? Well, uh, we're on a three-month release cycle now. So this release is coming up um, in a couple weeks now. Um, a couple major features are, are in it. Uh, the main one for the block device is incremental backup. So you can have it. It's, a, it's kind of like a, the ZFS concept of send and receive snapshots. You can uh, send and receive RBD snapshots now. You can export a, a diff a d the difference between one snapshot and another snapshot in the block device and save tons of uh, transfer time and storage space for, uh, say, the disaster recovery when you're backing up these uh, block devices to another site. Um, also, on the OSD side, um, there's support added for en encryption for data at rest. So an, as an, each OSD can have uh, its underlying file system uh, on, on top of a DM encrypted block device. And the keys right now are currently managed by um, the monitors because that's the, uh, the simplest pla uh, place to put them. That might be a, a point of uh, change in the future if there's uh, other uh, key management services that come up. For the Rados Gateway, um, there's a new REST API for managing the Rados Gateway, so you don't have to go through the command line all the time, which makes it a lot easier to use for uh, um, a lot of folks. And there's also more uh, performance improvements, especially for a small, uh, um, small I.O., uh, in including like, writes in particular. Um, most of those, uh, a, a number of those uh, performance improvements came from just moving some of the metadata that uh, Ceph stores about an object from the underlying local file system to a level DB instance, which is, um, there's a level DB instance uh, for each OSD. There's plenty more in there too, but those are just the main things that are kind of important for OpenStack users. So there's, um, what's next for the, after that though? Because this release is almost out. Well, the, the next release is called Dumpling. It'll be out in August, but and there's a, a couple of features that are pro, um, proposed so far. Um, there's geo-replication for the Raiders Gateway, so that it, it can be aware of um, multi-sites, multiple sites that don't have to be um, necessarily always in sync, but can be uh, synchronized asynchronously. And there's also a general re uh, REST management API for the Ceph cluster, and, um, not just the Raiders Gateway, but the whole Ceph system. So you don't have to go through the command line, you can just go through the HTTP API. Um, we're having a Virtual Ceph Developer Summit on May 6th. If uh, anyone wants to propose blueprints, they can go on our on Ceph.com, and there's a new wiki there. Um, anyone can add blueprints and come to the Ceph Developer Summit and discuss any new features they're interested in or interested in working on. Uh, we welcome any contributions anyone has. That'd be that would be great. And uh, I'd like to take any questions anyone has. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so the question is, um, is it possible when you're using block storage to kind of uh, control where the data is, goes so that you can move it closer to where the virtual machine is actually running? And um, that is possible in certain setups. So we basically, uh, Ceph has a concept of a, st a storage pool. And so you can have, for example, uh, DreamHost does this in their Dream Compute architecture, um, which is available online. Um, you can see that they have different uh, storage, like pods of uh, compute clusters. And that they have an associated storage pool with each compute cluster. So they just put the block, a block device that's going to a certain compute cluster in that same storage pod. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, can you have block storage and object storage in the same stuff cluster at the same time? And you absolutely can. That's like one of the big benefits of stuff is that you can use the same hardware in the same cluster to service many needs. So you can have the block storage and the object storage um, in the same cluster. They could use separate pools if you wanted to differentiate them in some way, like have more SSDs for one and SATA for the other. But uh, they can all be in the same cluster, no problem. So the question is, have we been working with Red Hat to get the kernel module for RBD into the RHEL 6 release? And uh, we've certainly been trying to work with them to get, uh, get more stuff into RHEL. Um, the 6 releases, I mean, it's set, the 7 release is the next one. And uh, it's not clear whether we'll be, we'll be able to get the kernel module in there or which parts of stuff we'll be able to get in there. But we're certainly um, looking, looking for that, uh, for, at that. And we now have uh, Ceph and Apple at least. But the question is, do we recommend the, the user space client or the kernel client for the file system? Um, at, at the moment, it, de it depends on your needs, I think, more than, uh, like the, the performance difference between them isn't that great right now because the Ceph file system is uh, relatively unstable still. It still needs more QA. But um, if you ha uh, the Ceph use is much easier to get started with because you don't need that kernel module and you don't need special uh, support for it. Back there. So the RBE does support discard and trim at the, the cumulative, cumulative level. Um, the OpenStack integration right now doesn't turn that on at all. So for n none of the backends can you configure um, block devices in OpenStack to enable that feature. But it's certainly a, an easy thing to add in the future. So RBD itself does support it though. Well, there's uh, lots of work going on going on the file system. Um, it certainly is important to many people, and lots of people are interested in it, um, and we're working on it quite hard. But uh, it's just it's just uh, it's it's a very much more complex piece than uh, the block device or object store. So the question is, do we have any plans to enable the static website hosting for Swift in addition to S3? Uh, I'm not sure of any plans for right now. I think we wouldn't want to try to like add our own extension to the API yeah, like unilaterally. So. Uh, what are the what are performance measuring tools or what are tuning tools available for looking at Ceph? Um, there's a couple different uh, ways you can look at this. Um, basically, at each level um, of Ceph, like at the Ceph client and the OSD level, there is a, something as an admin socket which you can use to query information about uh, latency or other performance statistics, like uh, of, of the last n requests. Um, in general, you can look at lots of things like uh, block device utilization and general I/O stats on the OSDs themselves. Uh, for the at the 
client side also, if uh, for example, you could look at the use the, using these uh, uh, the admin socket type of uh, access again. You can look at that, how efficient the cache is being used and whether it's actually benefiting you or not not for your workload. So there's a number of things there already, uh, although they could certainly be improved in the future. There's always room for improvement, right? So tuning tools. So the question is how to best, I guess you're asking about how to best um, tune for partition, partition sizes in particular. Um, generally, the partition sizes um, don't affect the performance too much. It's really about the, um, the memory usage on the OSDs. So we recommend about 100 placement groups per OSD per pool. Uh, what are the main differences between the Swift API and what the Raiders Gateway supports? Um, I don't remember all the differences off the top of my head. I think one of them might be out reversioning, but I'm not sure if that's supported now or not. Um, yeah, I think there's a chart on, on our, in our documentation somewhere that lists out exactly which, which calls are right out there. So what the, what's the upgrade process like since we're on the short release cycle? Um, generally, we're very careful about Eckers compatibility and rolling upgrades. So pretty much all upgrades um, we, t we test uh, at InkTank in particular um, between the stable releases very, pretty extensively, um, looking for possible causes for problems. And we, we're pretty careful to make sure that um, rolling upgrades are always possible. Uh, between the, is one of, of the Raiders Gateway or the Lock Device more reliable or longer history? Um, they were kind of started at similar times. Um, I'd say they're both at a similar level of reliability because they're both really depending on the core Rados uh, object store to, for all the fancy functionality. Like Rados itself is handling all the replication and all the consistency semantics. Rados, um, like the block device and the gateway are really kind of th much thinner wrappers around that. When would I expect the files to be at a similar level? Um, I can't really give any exact dates. It's when it's done when it's you know <laughs> when it's done. The question is about where reads come from, um, and reads come from only the primary copy, and this is um, especially use, uh, useful for cache efficiency, because it, it, on the underlying on the OSD they're stored as files. So when you're doing re a bunch of reads that hit in the same object, for example, that file is going to be in the page cache on the OSD. So if you had it spread across to multiple replicas, and you had reads hitting each of those replicas, your cache efficiency would be divided by the number of replicas you have. Um, so we. The uh, question uh, is about network traffic with uh, reads, and uh, it's true that uh, it reads to a single object. So if, you, if everything, everyone's trying to read a single object um, on the, uh, at the OSD level, you're going to the same OSD. So that's going to be a, it. Could be a, a bottleneck if you have a very small pipe to that OSD. But in general, um, we don't find that reading the same object from many places happens very often. Usually, there's either uh, there's some strafing going on, so. Different clients will be reading different objects at the same time, or there'll be some kind of caching layer at a higher level, which will make that re redundant. Yeah, so um, the question is about performance with respect to iSCSI compared to the block device. Um, I don't think we've done any specific comparisons recently, but um, about a year ago or so, someone did some comparisons themselves, and uh, they, they were very close. 
like almost exactly the same performance, with uh, so even with stuff providing much stronger guarantees about reliability and correctness. Um, the question is whether OpenStack is interested in replacing iSCSI with Ceph. I think uh, um, some people certainly are interested in that. I'm not sure. It's, I, I don't have a great, great gauge on that right now, but I think it might not be possible until perhaps there's more support in all the distributions, like uh, RHEL 6, for example. Are we testing against the ZFS on Linux uh, that's been released recently? We're not testing against it currently. Um, some folks are trying, to get, trying that out, and actually just yesterday, a bug in ZFS on Linux was found uh, because of that. So <laughs> it's certainly something to look for in the future, I think. Not right now. What are the plans for integration with Solometer status? Um, so right now, stuff isn't doesn't have any direct integration with Solometer, but it, there's a lot of potential, for example, for making the usage data from the Rados gateway go through to Solometer, or making the internal cluster statistics about performance or general service going to Solometer. Um, I'm not sure we have any concrete plans at the moment, but those are all certainly possible things. So why do people want to use ButterFS instead of XFS? Um, there's two reasons in general. So uh, at the, on the OSDs, there's uh, the, the data device, which is a, usually just a regular disk. And uh, you can also have a separate disk being a journal device, which aggregates writes before being flushed to the data disk. And with uh, ButterFS, because it has consistent snapshots and uh, transactions, um, we don't have to do as many uh, basically F syncs to the data disk to get the same consistency guarantees that we do on XFS. So it can provide a, a, a theoretical performance boost in that case. Um, it, uh, ButterFS also provides um, snapshotting internally. So um, the Ceph snapshots could, you can use the ButterFS snapshots if ButterFS is used, which saves a little bit more space. Any other questions? Is ButterFS consumed stable? Um, it's not the recommended choice right now. XFS is recommended because it's, it's generally more stable, and so, uh, there's still some performance problems with ButterFS over time as it, more, it gets more fragmented. So XFS is still uh, recommended as being more stable and less uh, likely to fragment. Sorry, what was that? The comment was that uh, ButterFS destroys the disks because it. Yeah, so ButterFS could certainly have a problem in SSDs, perhaps, because it wears them out faster. How does uh, Ceph treat different tenants in OpenStack? And right now, um, at the pool level, um, in Ceph, the pool level is the level of authentication. Um, but there's no, um, pools also map directly to placement groups, which consume more memory on an OSD. And so creating more pools for every single tenant you have uh, becomes unscalable because you, you have to use up more memory to try to manage all those placement groups. So right now, um, OpenStack uses a single pool for all tenants. In the future, it's certainly possible to add another layer on top of pools, which would be separate from placement groups, but adding another level of multi-tenancy. All right. Thanks very much.